Hey everyone, today we're looking at a video from a Christian guy who says he became an atheist once, and he's gonna tell us why he returned to Christianity. I would say I hope it's because he was convinced by arguments that established the existence of God and the truth of Christianity to him, but I've already seen this video, so unfortunately I know that's not the case. So if he didn't adopt a major belief about the origin and nature of reality itself because some argument for its truth convinced him, then what did convince him? Well, let's find out. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Leeming from The One Minute Preacher. Oh, hi Mark. I'm sorry for referencing the room, I'll flog myself after the video. Now, in my youth, I had dedicated my life to following Christ, and for the most part, I was fairly serious. Yet, it was in my late 20s and early 30s when I went through a long period of seriously questioning and doubting my Christian faith, which ultimately resulted in me ditching God altogether and briefly becoming an atheist in my mid-30s. Now, when people find this out about me, they're generally interested in, well, how did that happen? Why would I become an atheist? And yet a few people, I think, ask a more interesting question. What made me come back? All right, now that we're finally past my preface and your preface, we can get to the interesting stuff. So what made you go back to Christianity? And my response is quite simple. I began to question atheism with the same intensity and passion as I had with my Christian faith. That's great. Question everything. I approve. And if your questioning leads you to the conclusion that there is in fact a God and Christianity is true, well, I personally might question the quality of your questioning, but so be it. You gotta go where the arguments and evidence available to you lead you, not try to lead them to where you are. It's gonna be pretty hard to follow the path to truth if you purpose build the path to loop right back around to where you started. Of course, all of this is based on the assumption that when you question truth claims, your goal is to figure out if they're true. You see, here's the thing. After becoming an atheist, I quickly realized that both the belief in God and the belief that he doesn't exist, well, they both have their knowledge gaps, their ethical dilemmas, their moral catch-22s, which at the end of the day, they all require some sort of leap of faith. Okay, well, knowledge gaps I could understand having some impact on your belief about what's true, but I'm not sure how ethical dilemmas or moral catch-22s are relevant to it. I mean, you can see an awful lot of trolley problem memes, but that's not going to tell you much about whether there's actually a trolley or whether someone's really driving it. Oh, and by the way, ethical dilemmas don't require a leap of faith. They require attempting to determine, based on a predetermined set of priorities, the best possible outcome from a limited set of non-ideal choices, and then figuring out how you're going to realize that somewhat more preferable outcome. We'll talk about the predetermined set of priorities in a little while here because you're going to make it highly relevant real soon. But none of this requires or implies a leap of faith. That is, believing something to be factually true without sufficient justification. There's no need to believe that the action you take in response to the ethical dilemma will be the best option. You can make some educated guesses about what might help things work out the best. You can take precautions and you can hope it goes well, all without actually believing that what you're doing is the right thing. That's why it's a dilemma. Every option, even the one you pick, is doubtful and debatable. Otherwise, it's not much of a dilemma, is it? And this was very unsettling for me, because I think like the vast majority of atheists, especially your aggressive internet types, I, although I would have acknowledged that atheism didn't have all the answers, yet essentially all that did remain were a few T's that needed to be crossed and a few I's to be dotted. Now that's just foolish. Not because you thought atheism didn't have much work left to do, but because you expected atheism to do any work at all in this realm. There are no T's to cross or I's to dot because there are no letters. Atheism doesn't just not have all the answers to ethical questions, it in fact has no answers. And to expect it to is to commit a category mistake. Atheism is not a theory of ethics, it's a position on the existence of an entity. Now, atheists can of course go off and be ethical philosophers, or they can accept or reject ethical theories all day long, just like anyone else. And atheists can hold wildly different opinions on the subject. They can even turn to religion for their answers. There are plenty of options for non-theistic religions, and if none of those are satisfying, they can come up with their own. The mere fact that someone doesn't believe in a god, or believes there's no god, doesn't tell you anything about what that atheist actually believes about ethics and morality. 
It does tell you one thing that they don't believe about ethics and morality, which is that ethics and morality are handed down from a god. But aside from that, you get no information about what they do believe on the matter. It was religion that had all the problems. That really depends on the specific claims of the religion. I mean, I think all religion has problems because I think even at its best, it's an unnecessary and dishonest way of manipulating people into making choices out of superstitious forms of fear and hope, despite those people being entirely capable of deciding upon the same courses of action through informed reasoning or even just gut reaction if given the opportunity. But at least in terms of the moral ideas, if not necessarily the justifications for them, some very variants of religion are fine. I only thought that way because I had only seriously questioned my Christian faith. I had never put my atheism under the same intense scrutiny. Well, it's good that you would put your atheism under the same scrutiny as your Christianity, but you're talking about putting it under scrutiny for how it deals with ethical dilemmas, right? Well, let's say atheism doesn't deal with them at all because it doesn't. In that case, your scrutiny of your atheism isn't going to get you very far, aside from the fact that you have to figure those things out all by yourself. Or you could just read what someone else said and mindlessly, religiously believe it if you prefer, but please don't. Okay, great. So now you're at the point of, atheism doesn't address any of my questions about how I should act. Well, I feel for you. Figuring out what you think is the best response in a given scenario and why you think that can be tricky, and I'm very sorry that a challenge was presented to you, but how is your disappointment relevant to whether it's factually true that there's a god or not? So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Suppose a child is born with, say, cerebral palsy. The atheist would rightly ask, well, if the Christian God exists, who is supposed to be both good and loving, then answer that one, buddy. Kind of a sloppy way to ask that question, but sure. The question is, if the God is supposed to be all good, that is, everything it does is inherently good, but in your theistic worldview, cerebral palsy is inherently bad, then how could the all good God have inflicted cerebral palsy on the child, or allowed it to be inflicted with it without doing anything about it. So the argument is that if cerebral palsy is an evil, a bad thing, then the existence of it excludes the existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good God as described in Christianity. And so either a god exists who's missing one or more of those traits, or the god is defined as having to have all those traits which conflict with reality and so it doesn't exist at all. And then you might come back with some apologetics for it, and we might come back with some counter apologetics for it, and so on and so on. I'm not real into bringing that argument into this particular video too much, but that's a description of basically where the conversation tends to start. Now, you have to be careful to note that in this case, we're not talking about which actions are good or bad or why. This is an argument that happens once we've already decided that. No, in this case, the goodness or badness of things directly relates to the question of the existence of God, because it's part of a potential contradiction that's being pointed out between the traits and the actions of God, which can lead to the conclusion that a God with those traits can't logically exist. And it's an emotionally compelling argument with no easy rebuttals. No, there are some easy rebuttals. God is testing the child, even though he knows everything and should never need to test anything. God is the definition of goodness itself, and so everything he does is good. In which case, giving kids cerebral palsy is good. At least when God does it, regardless of his reasons. So really, you should have no problem with kids getting cerebral palsy, because God did it, and that means it's inherently good. So who cares? Another one is, uh, God has a bigger plan that for some reason requires kids to get cerebral palsy, even though he could instantly accomplish any goal he wants to and so has no need to make plans. And even if he still wanted to make a plan just for shits and giggles, he could make a perfect plan with no bad aspects to it because he's God. I never said the easy rebuttals are good, I just said they're easy. All that I can say is that while I don't know the why, I do know though that from a biblical point of view that God loves that child no less than a healthy one. That God doesn't have favorites, no preferences, there's no hierarchy. There are kids he'd prefer to deliberately give cerebral palsy instead of others. That girl is born in God's likeness and therefore has the same right to exist, to be protected and cared for as a healthy child. What therefore? So part of God's likeness is having a right to exist, be protected and be cared for? Okay, who has the responsibility to protect and care for God then? I'm sort of joking, obviously, but the point is your syllogism is broken. A person is born in God's likeness, therefore that person has rights. Why? You didn't make an argument for why being born in God's likeness means you have rights. You told me a premise, you told me a conclusion, but you left out the actual reasoning. 
Now, I understand that the likeness of God is often interpreted to imply value, but again, why? Actually, forget that. Forget why humans would be imbued with inherent value and rights just because they're in the image of God, because that's not the root of the argument. No, much more important here is the implicit assertion that God itself has inherent value. And again, I don't see why. If God exists, it's just another thing. Or maybe not a thing as such, depending on the Christian, but at least the thinking, willing, doing foundation of reality. And either way, I see no reason to attribute inherent value to that. At least not higher than the value we would assign to, for example, the universe or the planet. And even assigning an unusually high subjective value to it is questionable, when the only minds available to assign value to God would be it and us itself and its creation, which leads us right back to my opinion, which is that value is something that thinking beings attribute to things, not something that things inherently have. It's a Judeo-Christian belief in the sanctity of all human life. If the only reason to think that a being has a right to be protected and cared for is that it's a human, then I better not see any Christian apologists opposing trophy hunting or turning vegan or paying for cancer treatment for their pets. Just saying. After all, Jesus said that how you treat the least is how you treat him. The way God treats the least is he gives them cerebral palsy. So Jesus has cerebral palsy, I guess. That's interesting. Hey, you remember how you said that girl has the same right to exist to be protected and cared for as a healthy child? Well, giving a child cerebral palsy seems like pretty shit protection and care. It's almost like God himself doesn't care about that child's supposedly God-given rights. Now, obviously, many would consider that not to be a very satisfactory response. Impossible! That doesn't answer what we would consider to be the most important question of why. Just failing to answer the question of why wouldn't be such a big problem. What is a big problem is how many more questions and contradictions it raises. As a result, many simply leave it at that and assume that atheism is a better alternative. I think what you mean is they see the contradictions between the definition of God and the supposed actions of God, and they say, well, if I'd have to engage in so much doublethink just to believe that this thing even exists, maybe I don't. However, you can't be intellectually honest and leave it at that. Why? Is there some apologetic for the problem of evil that you think is both unquestionably successful and widely enough known that the only way to ignore it is intellectual dishonesty? Because the suffering child, it's just not a moral dilemma for the Christian. I would argue that it's even more so for the atheist. Oh, never mind. No apologetic, just whataboutism. All right, so apparently we're done considering the problem of evil of Christianity. We're uh, <coughs> leaving it at that, despite apparently the only way to do so being outright intellectual dishonesty. And now the argument becomes, apparently, yes, there's a dilemma there. Christianity doesn't offer good answers, and the arguments for God's contradictions stand. But what about atheism? What about it? For if the burden of proof is upon the Christian to prove that God can still exist in spite of the suffering child, then the burden of proof is upon the atheist to prove that that child has a right to exist, even if God doesn't exist. No, it absolutely is not. At least not when the conversation we're having is about whether theism or atheism is more factually correct. If you want to talk ethical philosophy, that's fine. We can do that. And if the atheist makes the claim that that child has a right to exist, even if God doesn't exist, then yeah, absolutely. If they want to convince you of that, then the burden of proof is on them. But when we're discussing whether God exists, that is, whether it's more rationally justified to believe in its existence and so be a theist, or to not believe in it and so be an atheist, which should be the topic of this video about why you return to believing that there is in fact a God, when we're discussing that, then no atheist is obligated to defend the quality of a non-theistic moral system, because our justifications for any actions or rules or laws are just not relevant to whether there actually is a god or not. And by just the same token, an atheist's opinion on the rules of your theistic morality or the basis for them is not, on its own, relevant in any way to the argument about God's existence. But on the other hand, if the characteristics that you as a theist assign to God contradict each other or contradict observable reality, that is very relevant to the discussion about God's existence because that would mean that God defies the law of non-contradiction, and you would have to explain why that's acceptable. As I explained, the purpose of the problem of evil argument is not to question the goodness of Christianity or to comment on how evil is a problem in general, but rather it's meant to directly address the existence of God by pointing out contradictions between its definition and its behavior. 
behavior. You can't win this argument by trying to change the topic to, well, where does your morality come from then, atheist? That's a valid question and a valid conversation to have, but it's a different conversation. Here's what I mean. If nature is all that there is, then what should become of that genetically defective child? Okay, for now we'll ignore the conversation about why you decided that God actually does exist and return to theism, and have that different conversation instead, because apparently that's more interesting to you, despite the topic of this video. So my answer would be there is no should. At least not a should that's inherently true, independent of the existence of human beings. Which I'm pretty sure is the kind of should that you're looking for. How does nature treat genetically defective offspring? It doesn't. Nature doesn't have offspring, and it doesn't treat anything anyway, because to treat someone a certain way you have to be able to behave in a particular way towards it, and nature, not being a living thing, does not have behaviors in the intentional sense. No, individual living things treat other living things in a certain way, and that varies wildly based on the living thing that's doing the treating. We'll get back to that soon. Does that child have the same right to exist, to be protected and cared for as a healthy child. Of course, rights are a legal concept. We created them to try to create a fair, peaceful, and happy society for everyone to live in. Under the laws of my country, and presumably yours, and by international agreement, that child does in fact have that right, yes. Now I know what you really mean is, should that child have that right, or even why should the child have that right, but I decided to answer the question that you actually asked first. Like Jesus, does Mother Nature say that how you treat the most vulnerable is how you treat her. Just to be clear about this, you know Mother Nature isn't a thing, right? That there is no her? That there's just nature, not Mother Nature? I assume you're using that term figuratively, but it doesn't serve a function here. It doesn't help to clarify which question you're trying to ask. Clearly, this isn't the case in the natural world. Nature operates on a completely different value system. Nature doesn't operate on a value system at all. Like I said, values are things that living, thinking, or at least feeling beings have. Not something nature in general has. There is no monolithic value system of nature. Mother Nature has clear preferences healthy offspring. You seriously gotta stop painting this mother nature as some goddess with one preferred reproductive strategy among all the various strategies employed by all the species on earth. For one thing that's not how nature works, and for another thing it makes you sound like you don't know what an atheist is. We don't believe in a nature goddess that prefers things. Oh, Mother Nature, tell me which reproductive strategy you deem worthy so that I can deal with my offspring according to your will. Infanticide, the killing of genetically defective offspring, is widespread throughout nature. Birds toss out the weak from the nest to die. The runt in a litter of pigs is ignored until it starves to death. I don't think all birds do that. Penguins probably don't. But sure, point taken, some species of animals will let their offspring die or even kill them if they're weak. Typically the ones that create large quantities of offspring and have to dedicate their resources to the ones that are most likely to survive. And the human animal generally won't. Sometimes infanticide does happen, of course, but it's exceedingly rare in our species. But you see what you're doing here, right? You're deliberately picking and choosing examples of animals that commit regular infanticide of their own offspring in order to paint some picture that this is the only way animal species ever treat their young? How about we think about animals that are a little bit more like us? Animals with slower reproductive cycles and higher social instincts and more emotion towards members of their group. Animals like elephants or orcas. They commit infanticide a lot less, especially when it comes to their own offspring. These species often raise infants that are weak or that are sick. In practical evolutionary terms, probably because the cost of reproduction is so high, but on an individual level more likely out of an emotional attachment that motivates them to do it. And when the animal species survives primarily through cooperation, as is unquestionably the case with humans, that gets even stronger. This idea that some religious people have, yourself apparently included, that evolution solely functions based on death is completely false. Survival, for many animals, doesn't just require killing everything around you. It also requires preserving life, not just of the individual but also of its relatives and even the greater group. And in some species, that means taking care of our few offspring, even if those offspring are not ideally suited to survive. 
Of course, even in an absurd hypothetical where every single individual of every other species on the planet will immediately devour all but the most perfectly healthy offspring, and no parent of even the most social, non-human species has any attachment at all to its young, that still would not make our way of behaving towards our young unnatural. It would mean that the tool of emotional connection to our offspring originated in humans. The existence of a trait that evolved uniquely in humans does not mean that trait is unnatural by definition. Of course, then you could make an argument about whether that trait is too complex to have evolved in the amount of time since we diverged from, say, chimpanzees, but again, totally hypothetical because that's not how this works. Anyway, so in humans, it goes even deeper than I've said so far because that basic compulsion to care for our young that comes from our strategy for passing on our genes, that primal connection that we feel to other people that makes us feel so much incredible pain when it's broken, is something that we've embedded so deeply into our culture that not only have we added yet another layer of strength to our internal pull toward favoring life and helping each other, especially our own families, but we also feel a strong sense of shame when we're thought of as the kind of people who don't have such concerns. I'm speaking in generalities, of course. There are some people who don't feel that, and those people tend to be looked upon with suspicion by the people who do. So no, nature is not some goddess that prefers some way of treating offspring. Animal behavior is no monolith. Nature has a niche for just about every strategy you can think of, including ours. Rats eating their deformed offspring works just fine for rats. But in case you hadn't noticed, we're not rats or birds, or pigs. Our commitments to others of our species serve us exceedingly well, as you can plainly see by the tremendous success that's brought us, and there's no reason nor widespread inclination to change that now just because some personification of nature supposedly likes birds tossing chicks out of their nests. So why don't you try approaching this issue with a little intellectual honesty next time? So if humans are but a mere extension of the natural world, then who says we are to operate on a completely different value system from nature's? We don't. Your hypothetical is that humans are entirely natural and there is no god. Well, in that case, our value system is just as natural as we are, and therefore, no matter what value system we operate on, we are in fact operating on nature's value system, because nature's value system includes all value systems. And so this objection makes no sense. Now, specifically on the topic of whether I believe in the right of a child with cerebral palsy to exist and be cared for, certainly I do. My brother was born with a pretty severe genetic syndrome, and he ended up dying from it at two years old. I was only four years old when he died, so it lacks much direct emotional impact for me. But the impact that it had on my family was devastating, and in many ways its repercussions never ended. Some scars are just too deep to really heal. Take that pain, multiply it by a few million, and you start to see my problem. I don't need any intellectual justification to oppose this. Now, of course, not every single person on the planet feels empathy, although most do. But right this second, I'm not talking about all or most people. I'm not talking about which worldview is the most useful to the society. I'm just talking about me as an individual. And what I'm trying to convey here is that while there is value in having good intellectual justifications for your moral opinions, individuals don't actually necessarily require an intellectual reason to still really feel the need to oppose certain actions. Morality isn't a question of truth or falsehood, so it doesn't work that way. It's a question of human nature and what humans want and how humans feel. At the root of it, it's about emotional responses and human connections and the subjective value that we place on each other and social instincts and cultural backgrounds and feelings about past experiences and concern for the well-being of society at large, inbuilt empathy, things that we have because of the kind of animal that we are and the kind of entirely natural and very evolutionarily beneficial survival strategy that's kept our species alive and thriving all this time. I see no reason to treat our ability to care for each other and to help the weak succeed alongside the strong as any less of a critical factor in our rise to absolute dominance over our environment than our ability to think rationally. Both of those faculties sometimes fail miserably, but when they don't, 
count, they're both enormously useful. And if nature had not resulted in you possessing tools to feel concern for others, you wouldn't give a damn about morality, at least not deep down in your gut. Of course, there are utilitarian arguments for preserving the lives of the weak and for all kinds of other moral questions, but I'm talking about that primal, visceral reaction that you have when somebody proposes to you the idea of killing the weak, which is hard to get from an argument. Now, on this cerebral palsy issue specifically, I have absolutely no trouble telling you directly that my starting point for my reaction to it is not intellectual, but instead it's that I care about people emotionally and their suffering makes me feel some degree of suffering as well, which makes me oppose these things even though I don't think and never have thought that any particular morality can be described as true or false, or that some moral code is dictated by a celestial king, and that it's absurd absurd beyond belief to try to define away the human role in creating the complex moral frameworks which humans have been proposing and refining and arguing about, and in some cases even fighting over on a societal and individual level for millennia at least, and the results of which both you and I now use to guide our interactions with other humans. And the funny thing is, I think you're the same as I am. Not about thinking morality is by humans for humans, obviously not, but about having an emotional and not intellectual starting point for your opinion on killing weak children. And it's not just because I'm making the assumption that you're a nice person. You do seem like a nice guy, but who knows, right? But no, the reason I say it is that in this very video you've provided evidence that you don't actually require any philosophical, intellectual justification to not murder a kid with cerebral palsy, because you already don't want to, purely on an emotional basis. There's no serious urge in you to kill children that you require some intellectual reason to suppress, which is the only reason you yourself would need an intellectual reason. Now I'm just talking about you specifically, Mark, not people in general now, because we're talking about your belief here. So why do I say that? Why do I say that you don't seem to have any need for a philosophical justification? Well, think about what you've been doing. You made a decision to believe in Christianity not because you think it's true, apparently, because this video is about your reason for converting back to Christianity and you didn't talk about any arguments for Christianity's truth, but rather arguments against atheism having moral imperatives. So your starting point for all of this, before you decided on your worldview, was I don't want people to be killed just for being weak. There's something inside you, deep inside you, a million years of biology and history and culture that are screaming at you to not approve of that behavior. And then based on that feeling, you chose the belief system that you think has the clearest rules in favor of your pre-established moral opinion. The belief system that you think most clearly says, don't do what you already desire not to do. This is the predetermined set of priorities that I said earlier I was going to talk about. It's like you for some reason think there's some pressure on you to murder children with cerebral palsy. Some social judgment that'll come your way if your sole response when you're asked why you don't do it is to say, I don't wanna, instead of providing some post hoc excuse for not wanting to. Well, that's not the case, Mark. I promise you, most people are not gonna judge you because you don't kill kids just because you don't want to. It's okay. I feel like telling yourself that you don't have that gut reaction totally independent of and preceding your religious ideals, for no reason other than that you would prefer to give the credit for your cooperative social behavior to your religion so that it sounds more important and you can win more converts, is just a dishonest denial of your own nature. To me it sounds as asinine as running around telling people you have the brain of a crocodile. You're not a crocodile, Mark, and neither am I, so why are you pretending? But anyway, there's something a little bit funny about this whole line of discussion. Because if the reason that you picked your worldview is that it says that you shouldn't murder kids, then that worldview's injunction against murdering kids is of no use to you because you chose that worldview on the basis that you already thought that it was wrong to murder kids. You can search around for a moral system that'll tell you some action is wrong, but that just means you're looking for that system because you already think that action is wrong, so you don't need a system to tell you so. And the fact that the system you settle on tells you so is meaningless. Hey, remember when you mentioned Catch-22 earlier? Well, as I said at the beginning of this video, both the belief in God and the belief that he doesn't exist have their moral Catch-22s, which at the end of the day requires some sort of leap of faith. Yeah, just like that. Catch-22. 
So to sum this all up, your reason for converting from atheism to Christianity was not that you became convinced again that God actually exists and that the Bible is true. In fact, not one word you said in this video implies that you care about the truth. Nope, it's just that you failed to notice that humans are not birds or pigs, and you failed to come up with any of the numerous pragmatic reasons to be nice to sick children. But you still felt the urge to be nice because you're a naturally well-adjusted human animal, and so you picked whatever idea gave you some vague reason to back up what you already thought was true, even if that reason is totally lame. Awesome. So, audience, I know that one was a little more serious than usual, but I gotta switch it up occasionally. If you like my channel, subscribe and thumb up the video, and if you really, really like what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon like all the awesome people on the screen. They and all of the other people who support through Patreon and PayPal are the absolute best. Sign up to my email list at list.logic.com for one day early notifications for my videos, and thank you very much for watching, I'll see you all again soon. You ever seen a bird or a pig cross the street at a crosswalk? Clearly Mother Nature's value system opposes traffic regulations, so there can't be any reason for them. From now on, I'm driving double the speed limit and ignoring every red light I see. Does that please you, Mother Nature?